Um, what I'm more interested now is, because uh, this is going to drag on for a while, and I'm getting old, um, but what I'm more interested in now is practical applications of this, which has to do with Alzheimer's disease. And I was talking uh, to Steve about this before. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically, in Alzheimer's disease, there's two lesions. So there's these amyloid plaques yep. that are these big, ugly things that are in between the neurons. So like there's a neuron here, neuron here, so out here there's a big, ugly, and they say, well, it, it affects the synapses and that's what causes the dementia. Yeah. But uh, memory is not in that. But, and then there's another type of lesion that are inside the neuron, which is called uh, the neurofibrillary tangle. And that's made up of tau proteins. Tau? Tau, T-A-W, T-A-U, sorry, T tau. And, uh, and tau is uh, a microtubule associated protein. So normally tau is sitting on the microtubule. So here's micro the tau sits on it and acts as a traffic signal for these motor proteins that move along to tell, okay, get off here and deliver your cargo to this synapse. So it's a form of learning, the placement of the tau on the microtubule. And it could also be the tau stabilizes the microtubule. Well, somehow for, for, for some reason, there we go. There's a tau protein. Uh, uh, so the amyloid plaques are outside and the tau tangles are inside and the microtubule is disintegrating mm -hmm. below. And so what happens is when the tau falls off, uh, the microtubule di uh, disassembles and you can see the tubulins coming off on the right side. So the, mi the microtubule literally uh, disassembles, depolymerizes, and uh, it'd be like uh, the bones in your body disintegrating and you get really short, really fast. And, yeah. just kinda, and that's what happens to the neuron. The neuron shrinks because it's losing its cytoskeletal support. And I'm saying that the, uh, the memory is stored in the microtubules in the relationship of all those, uh, those little spheres, which are actually should be little barbells, little, little peanut shapes. And, uh, and, and uh, the tau either stabilizes the microtubule or acts as memory. In either case, uh, so the amyl well, the amyloid plaques they fuck with the tau proteins, they no, they hurt the tau proteins. I don't know what they do. I mean, everybody uh, they're not connected to the tau. They're, they have nothing to do with. There's a lot of theories, but nobody knows. Okay, the gotcha. point is that uh, that in post mortem studies, yeah, uh, of somebody who had uh, uh, severe Alzheimer's mm -hmm. and dementia, or had lo loss of a memory. And you look, and uh, the correlation, there's much, much better correlation with ta with uh, neurofibrillary tangles or tau proteins than with uh, with the amyloid. Oh, interesting. You can have the amyloid and not have the disease. You can have the disease and not have the amyloid. Uh, wow. if you, but if you have the disease, you're going to have the tau proteins and vice versa. It correlates a lot better. So the tau is because the microtubules fall apart. And or or the the the, the tau correlates with the microtubules falling. So apart. the more tau proteins, the more memory loss, the more dementia. The more tau protein that's that's not on not on the microtubule, and it, it can that's not on the microtubule. Right, it can okay. it can be in, in the in the neuron in the corner in these tangles, neurofibrillary tangles, and it can spill out into the blood or the CSF. So if you do a spinal tap on a patient with uh, with Alzheimer's, you get tau in the CSF. You can see it in the urine. You can see it in the blood because it's spilling out of the of the oh, nervous wow. system. So it just tells you that uh, tau is being lost, and it's coming off the microtubules because what it normally does is the microtubule. It's a microtubule associated protein and stabilizes it. So the oh, pro wow. the problem is, and this was known in 1989. There was a paper by uh, Matsuyama and Jarvik. Uh, Libby Jarvik, who was a uh, neuro neurologist who was married to uh, Robert Jarvik, who invented the art first artificial heart. But uh, that's neither here nor there. But she and this guy Mats Matsuyama came out with a theory or with a paper in PNAS in, in uh, 1989, uh, microtubules the key to uh, Alzheimer's disease. And at that time, people were just learning about, ta about um, the amyloid. So I remember she came to the University of Arizona and I went to her talk. It was a great talk. And I said, yeah, that makes perfect sense. So at, right after that, our neuroscience group dealing with Alzheimer's and, and neurology, we had a big meeting and um, about what to do about this because they, they were all jumping on the, on the amyloid bandwagon and the drug companies were throwing money at them to, to find anti-amyloid uh, antibodies and, and this and that, which is what they did. And they've been developing ever since uh, these anti-amyloid drugs mm -hmm. for Alzheimer's, which don't work, are Probably toxic. Have crazy side effects. 
Crazy side effects are toxic, they cause bleeding, and they're expensive as hell. They cost like twenty to thirty thousand per patient per year. And the drug companies are getting rich. Cha Ching. Yeah. The drug companies and the researchers are getting are getting uh, wealthy doing this. So um uh you know neuroprotective <laughs> nicotine. Um uh well I got caffeine. <laughs> anyway, um the amyloid plaques. Yeah, so yeah. amyloid plaques I think are a, a red herring. And uh, you know, they they don't really correlate with the disease, but they attract all the money and the attention. Do they correlate with anything that we know of? Uh, it depends who you ask. Uh, right. well, I have a I have a good friend Rudy Tanzi, who's a big uh, Alzheimer's research at uh, researcher at, at Harvard, and he's been studying amyloid. He's completely on the amyloid uh, train, but his whole financial picture, you know, his he started a company. That's where it gets messy. It gets very messy. Yeah. So. Um, uh, I don't have a, a a dog in the hunt in that, in that, in that regard. And I think it's microtubule. Well, I, I guess I do because of my theory, but it would support it. But as far as helping people, that doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. So uh, in researching this, I found out that microtubule stabilizing drugs, which are used in cancer to prevent the microtubules from disassembling and becoming metallic spindles, uh, that they actually are protective against Alzheimer's. And in some animal studies and actually clinical studies, a, uh, a particular drug, apothalone B, which is a, a microtubule stabilizing drug. Apothalone B. Epothalone B. Epothalone B. Epothalone B. It's actually an anti-cancer drug. And uh, a friend of mine, Mike Weiss, just did a study where he gave he gave this to uh, to rats and then put them to sleep and found out he needed more anesthesia when they had this microtubule stabilizing drug, that the, that the apothalone B was blocking the anesthetic from getting to the uh, target in the microtubule. Whoa. Uh, Anyway, somebody was doing a study for Alzheimer's with apothalone B, and uh, and uh, they found that it, they found out that it helped, and they did a pilot study, and then they started a big study, and then all of a sudden they disappeared. They stopped. The study was was halted for no apparent reason, and they vanished. What? Yeah, uh, I, it sounds crazy. The people vanished. Well they stopped publishing, and nobody could find them. So they either got paid off by the drug companies. Or they got whacked. Maybe. I hope not. Well, I hope not either. Well, but I, I, they probably got paid off. And uh, so anyway, they stopped. This is like the story. I was just was so, so funny. I was just watching this uh, this interview my friend Jesse Michaels did today. And there was, he's talking about these two guys who came up with cold fusion. That oh, yeah. vanished right after. I forget what their names were. Oh, yeah. I remember that. Uh, yeah. Well, these guys vanished. I, you know, I hope they're okay. But uh, in the... The the previous uh, apothalone B is is off patent because it's been around for a while, so you can't patent it, and there's no way to make money off of this. So they didn't want it, and uh, uh, and every new and every new. Uh, so this is not is this currently used for anti cancer? For anti cancer, yes, it is used, yes. even though that it's doesn't make any anybody any money. Well, yeah, yeah, I don't know if they, so. It's like the other. What was the COVID drug that everyone got mad at? Um, that was not patented, but it won a Nobel Prize. There was a similar drug that was used for COVID that was, anyways, I can't remember what it was. They called it horse paste or something. Oh, yeah, I don't remember. Ivermectin. Ivermectin, yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Horse, yeah. Horse dewormer. I don't know if it worked for COVID or not. Yeah, uh, I don't, I don't do think I. so. But uh, anyway, so this this drug disappeared, uh, but it, it, it does antagonize anesthesia, which, which helps our theory. Okay, so if, if not that, so anyway, in... Um, when Anurban discovered uh, 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 the, uh, the kilohertz, megahertz, gigahertz, terahertz, and microtubules in around uh, uh, 2010, he first published in 2013, um, I said, wow, what, I wonder if we could use any of those frequencies to treat mental and cognitive disorders by resonating the microtubules. So um, kilohertz is electromagnetic. Uh, Megahertz is also in electromagnetics is, is radio waves. Uh, gigahertz is microwaves and terahertz are photons. So I didn't want to put any electromagnetics into the brain necessarily. Uh, and photons are hard to get in and they're also electromagnetic. But uh, I, as an anesthesiologist, uh, I'm, I was very familiar with ultrasound. Mm. And I remember uh, looking up and seeing an ultrasound machine in, in the, and I said, wait, that's megahertz. Ultrasound are as, which, as you know, passes through the body. You can see the baby in the uterus. You can. We use an anesthesia to see uh, nerves for nerve blocks, the jugular vein to hit the jugular vein, and uh, so uh, and you know you use it as a to see into the body because 
the waves pass harmlessly through the body, then reflect off surfaces so you get an image back. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, w I wondered if anybody had uh, tried megahertz uh, ultrasound into the brain to treat depression or Alzheimer's or anything. And the answer was no, but it was approved for uh, brain imaging. And it's not that good for brain imaging, but before they had CT and MRI, it was good enough, I guess, better than nothing. And it was still used at that time, and I think it's still used for newborns to look through the, the fontanelle for bleeds. So the they don't have bone here, so it's just straight into the brain. And they ultrasound for like 30 minutes at a time to look for signs of, of bleeding without any apparent uh, negative effect in newborns. So I said, well, it can't, it can't be that, uh, that harmful. And, uh, and then uh, uh, I found this guy, actually a guy at Arizona State University, our arch rival. I'm from University of Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> we hate those guys. I, I, no, not really, but uh, they're a big sports rival. And uh, he had been studying it in uh, animals, in, ultrasound into the brain of animals and uh, seeing physiological effects. And so he could like ultrasound here and make the paw move here or put electrodes in and see electrical. So he's getting physiological effect, didn't seem harmful. So uh, at the time, uh, well, still, we had a, a pain clinic in our anesthesia department, which I used to run. So I knew chronic pain patients. They're mostly, de they're usually depressed and they're chronic pain. And I said, I wonder if this would help our chronic pain patients, their mood, because they all have, you know, crappy moods, they're depressed. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, taught, I, I said, hey, to my colleagues, and I said, we should try this on our chronic pain patients. And they go, yeah, right, Hammer. That was my, that's my nickname in anesthesia. This is my put patients to sleep with a hammer. <laughs> they say- That's comforting. <laughs> it's a joke, but I'm actually very, I was very gentle and I'm pretty good at it. Anyway- right, um, right before you put the patient to sleep, <laughs> you start telling them your theory of consciousness. Wait, wait. No, I tell them jokes actually. I tell them <laughs> this is going to burn in your vein, but melt in your brain or, uh, <laughs> or a few other jokes that I can't really repeat because they're not going to remember. It's but hammer it, time. Hammer time, yeah. And, uh, but anyway- um, they said, yeah, Hammer, uh, great idea. You go first. You got a nice shaved head. We'll yeah, watch. Right. So they call my bluff. And so one day, the end of the day, we uh, we sat around a table and uh, we brought an uh, ultrasound machine. And uh, so they're all kind of watching. I'm getting a little self-conscious here. But um, so I put the goo, you have to have this gel. And I held yep. it to my uh, uh, temple area because I know that's a, uh, mm -hmm. and I uh, held it there for about 15, 20 seconds. I didn't know how long to, to hold it. And uh, I, I didn't feel anything. I was a little disappointed. Uh, but about a minute later, a couple minutes later, I started to get a buzz, and I was buzzed for like a couple hours. I felt really creative. What kind of a buzz? Kind of like a mile high, kind of like invigorated. Uh, uh, like stimulated? Mildly stimulated, uh, you know, just feeling good. Slightly high and uh, thinking very well, thinking very clearly. Wow. And uh, creative and, and and a little little euphoria. I mean, I, I felt really good. So, Steve, uh, add that to the grocery list. <laughs> so uh, most of this was after I went home. So I came back the next morning and, and told my, I said, we got to try this. We got to do this on our chronic pain patients. <laughs> And, and so we did, and um, we uh, wrote a protocol, double blind study, because on the ultrasound machine, you can hit a button and free and it freeze the, so there's no beam, there's no ultrasound coming out of the device, but still, the machine's still making noise, the same noise. Yeah. So uh, we did a double blind study and on 30, uh, 30 pain patients, and uh, we found statistical improvement in mood and almost statistical improvement in, um, in their pain reduction. And uh, published uh, in the journal, a very good journal, Brain Stimulation, the first study on, uh, on uh, uh, effects of ultrasound on uh, mental, effect, mental states in humans. And Jamie Tyler from Arizona State, who had done all this work for years on animals, and uh, you know he got scooped on the first uh, human, and he, he emailed me, he said, congratulations, you got the first human study. Of wow. course, he got all the patents. Is this had, published? Yeah, published 2013. I'll, I'll send you the send you the link. Wow! And since then, uh, and there have been hundreds, if not thousands, of papers on brain ultrasound for this and that.